and we are going to finish the first chapter of Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. We've been introduced to Flora Post, the 19-year-old recently orphaned girl who must find a way to live on 100 pounds a year. She's going to write to relatives all over the country and see if she can stay with them. Right now she's staying with her 26-year-old friend, Mrs. Smiling, a recent widow who is courted by many men called the Pioneeros. One of them, Bicky, is taking is being taken out by her and Flora, as well as Flora's cousin, Charles. We will start in the middle of the paragraph we left off in last time. Not in the middle. We left off in the middle of the paragraph. We'll start at the beginning of the paragraph we left off in the middle of. Bicky, who had a shocking stammer, talked a great deal, as people with stammers always love to do. He was plain and 30-ish and home on leave from Kenya. He pleased them by corroborating all the awful rumors they had heard about the place. Charles, who looked well in tails, spoke hardly at all. Occasionally, he gave a loud, deep musical ha-ha when amused at anything. He was twenty-three and was to be a parson. He stared out of the window most of the time and hardly looked at Flora. I don't think Snatter approves of this excursion, observed Mrs. Smiling as they drove away. He looked all dim and concerned, did you notice? He approves of me because I look serious, said Flora. A straight nose is a great help if one wishes to look serious. I do not wish to look serious, said Mrs. Smiling coldly. There will be time enough for that when I have to come and rescue you from some impossible relations living in some ungetatable place because you can't bear it any longer. Have you told Charles about it? Good heavens, no! Charles is a relation. He might think I wanted to go and live with him and Cousin Helen in Herefordshire. I was angling for an invitation. Well, you could if you liked, said Charles, turning from his study of the glittering streets gliding past the windows. There is a swing in the garden, and tobacco flowers in the summer, and probably Mother and I would like it, would quite like it if you did. Don't be silly, said Mrs. Smiling. Look, here we are. Did you get a table near the river, Bicky? Bicky had managed to do that, and when they were seated, facing the flowers and lights on their table, they could look down through the glass floor at the moving river and watch it between their slippers as they danced. Through the, glass wall, through the glass walls, they could see the barges going past, bearing their romance red and green light, their romantic red and green lights. Outside, it had begun to rain, and the glass roof was trickling with silver. Of, in the course of supper, Flora told Charles of her plan. He was silent at first, and she thought he was shocked, for though Charles had not a straight nose, it might have been written on him. It might have been written on him, as Shelley wrote of himself. In the preface to Julian and Medallo, Julian is rather serious. But at last, he said, looking amused, Well, if you get very sick of it, whatever you are, phone me, and I will come and rescue you in my plane. Have you a plane, Charles? I don't think an embryo parson should have a plane. What breed is it? A twin Bichella bat. Its name is Speed Cop 2. Oh, really, Charles? Do you think a parson not to have a Lane, continued Flora, who was in a foolish mood. What has that got to do with it? said Charles calmly. Anyway, you let me know and I will come along. Flora promised that she would, for she liked Charles, and then they danced together, and all four sat a long time over coffee, and then it was three o'clock, and they thought it time to go home. Charles put Flora into her green coat, and Bicky put Mrs. Smiling into her black one, and soon they were driving home through the rainy streets of Lambeth where every house had windows alight with rose, orange, or gold, behind which parties were going on, card or musical or merely frivolous, and the lit shop windows displayed a single frack, displayed a single frock or a tang horse to the rain. There's the old diplomacy, said Mrs. Smiling interestedly, as they passed that ludicrous box with baskets of metal flowers tipping off the narrow sills of its windows and music coming from its upper rooms. How glad I am that poor Todd left it to me. It does bring such a lot of money. For Miss Smiling, like all people who have been disagreeably poor and have become deliciously rich, had never grown used to her money, and was always mentally turning it over in her hands and position, positively reveling in the thought of what a lot of it she had. And this delighted all her friends, who looked on with approval, just as they would have looked upon a nice child with a toy. Charles and Vicky said good night at the door because Mrs. Smiling was too afraid of Sneller to ask them in for a last cocktail, and Flora muttered that it was absurd, but all the same she felt rather subdued as the two wandered to bed up the narrow black carpeted staircase.
Tomorrow I will write my letters, said Flora, yawning with one hand on the slender white baluster. Oh, good night, Mary, Mrs. Smelling said. Good night, darling. She added that tomorrow Flora would have thought better of it. And that is the end of chapter one.